Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we look at munitions and clothing production, railways and shipbuilding, and shipping and overseas trade. We hear first from Dr Gerard Charmley about the munitions industry. I am Dr Gerard Charmley. My area of interest is munitions. I'm going to be looking at how Britain reacted to the circumstances of the Great War. The British Army, on the eve of the Great War, was not an army resting on its laurels. The South African War what Kipling called our imperial lesson, had been heeded. There had been numerous changes made, including the establishment of a Department of Ordnance as part of the War Office, headed up by a Master General. Most of Britain's procurement was done in-house, as it were. There were the great ordnance factories, particularly the Woolwich Arsenal, and there had been real efforts to ensure that the supply of munitions was put on a professional and organised basis. The only thing was that Britain was intending to have a relatively short war. The Haldane reforms establishing the British Expeditionary Force envisaged in modern-day parlance a rapid reaction force, small enough to be deployed to a crisis hotspot, whether that was within the empire or to France to block a German advance or to deliver a decisive blow. What was not envisaged was a huge multi-division army requiring an awful lot more shells and other weapons than Britain had. When war breaks out, the munitions industry is encouraged almost into a business-as-usual plan. The War Office believes that it can meet the needs by ramping up production. However, almost immediately, it's very obvious that there are problems. One only has to look at the recruiting slideshows which appeared in many village halls One sees men wearing their civilian clothing, practising with sticks rather than rifles. The War Office not only has their in-house, so the Royal Armaments Factories, they've also got a list of approved firms. These are the people that they will go to if they have need. People like Camel Laird, Armstrongs, Vickers, the big arms manufacturers. The problem is that as the army gets bigger, these firms are also struggling. By the time you get into 1915, there are problems, particularly supplying enough shells for the big guns. That is, once they've sorted out the problem with supplying big guns in the first place. It doesn't help that about two-thirds of the army's shells are shrapnel, perfectly useful, if you're fighting Burkamandos in South Africa. But they are no use at all against entrenched positions and not against concrete bunkers. The problem is that it takes the war office an awfully long time to decide that this war is not going to return to being a war of movement. The only equivalent big wars that they have had, the Franco-Prussian, the Boer War in South Africa, and the Russo-Japanese War had all been, relatively speaking, wars of movement. If you'd had big set-piece battles, it was everyone manoeuvring for days and days beforehand, and then after the battle, falling back. Not a continuous need for shells, high explosive. It doesn't help that even since the Russo-Japanese War in 1905-06, there has been a change in technology, Guns can fire a lot more shells than anyone had been expecting. Kitchener has his own theory. He believes that too many technical men have rushed to the colours. One of the problems with an all-volunteer army is that there was no provision initially for people to be told, do not join up. 
kitchen as big a thing is we don't have enough men. All we need to do is to rebalance industry and everything will be fine. He employs an industrialist to find out what is wrong. He looks at it and he says, the problem is not just we don't have the men, we don't have the industrial capacity. Kitchener is incredibly bad as a minister. He's a very competent man. He is one of the few people who expected a very long war and a mass army, but he's not used to talking about it. When he's expected to go before cabinet, he's tremendously put out, what do these people know? I'm in charge, not you guys. Lloyd George and others more or less have to drag Kitchener into some sort of collegial responsibility when they set up towards the beginning of 1915, a cabinet committee on shells. It's a second attempt. The first attempt, Kitchener had just said no. Asquith has to then sit on him and say, look, I am Prime Minister, you are not. You will come to this committee. They get Lloyd George, Churchill, R.B. Haldane and others on board to discuss how are we going to cope with shells shortage. Good work is done. For example, trying to get firms which are not used to making shells, to at least make bits of shells. The problem, again, is that the army doesn't think it'll work. Lloyd George, his war memoirs, is very scathing. This shows the military mind. These people did not know what they were doing. The army do have a point. If you're getting people who don't know how to make shells to make shells, you run the risk of those shells either not working at all or exploding early. Robert Graves, for example, they reckoned that the artillery on his section of the line lost more men to their own shells exploding prematurely than to German gunfire. Kitchener eventually puts the kibosh on the shells committee by simply saying, I'm not turning up to any more meetings. And of course, without the Secretary of State for War, this committee is not really going to go anywhere. You've got Lloyd George and others, descriptions of Kitchener as the warlord. And you do get this impression. He relishes this idea of being the lonely man. Asquith says that the problem with Kitchener is almost all of his campaigns have been one-man jobs. There are changes made. Certain companies are now being allowed to make bits of shells. Asquith recollects that by the end of April 1915, quote, we were, despite heart-rending delays in delivery by contractors, producing in three days the amount of ammunition which we produced before the war in a whole year. Slowly you have a change as well in terms of putting more explosives in the shell and leaving out the bits of lead that were in the shrapnel shells. The problem is the army is still massively short and a big battle is sufficient to wipe out the reserves they've got. Britain is not alone in this. Nobody knew how many shells this sort of warfare would require. The Germans and the French, both of whom had been wargaming for this sort of thing, both end up with shell shortages. You get to a position where the French guns, I think, have seven shells a day. In May of 1915, you start getting rumblings that there is something seriously wrong at the front. Sir John French, commander of the British Expeditionary Force, the BEF, is not happy with what he's got. And when you start getting shells diverted to the Dardanelles operation, things get even worse. He communicates with Rappington, who's the Times correspondent, and mentions this. Within days, the Northcliffe papers, the Times, the Mail, were saying Britain's armies are being starved of shells you have Battle of Orbo Ridge, which does stall for want of high explosives. This feeds back in then to the Times and the Mail. It doesn't help Asquith that the Conservatives also clearly have sources within the British Expeditionary Force. Asquith does very much think that Sir John French has deliberately let the opposition and the press know in an act of insubordination. At the same time, Asquith proceeds to deny that there is anything wrong until it becomes quite obvious to everybody that there is something very badly wrong. The net result of this is that the Asquith government falls. They have got to seek a reconstruction of the government on coalition lines, bringing in Conservatives, 
bringing in representatives of Labour. At this point, David Lloyd George is moved from the Treasury, having been Chancellor of the Exchequer, to a newly created Ministry of Munitions of War, tasked with solving the crisis. The war changes the image of Lloyd George. This is the man who was the scourge of the peers, a Welsh nonconformist genius, the heir of Oliver Cromwell, the man who is going to put pay to all aristocratic privilege. Suddenly he emerges as the great advocate of national efficiency. This is 25th of May 1915, the formation of the coalition. Bonalore and Balfour come to see Lloyd George as a man of efficiency. This is the man who will make things happen. So Lloyd George comes into Whitehall Gardens, where the Ministry of Munitions is based. There were four chairs and a table. This ministry then goes from almost a joke to being the key wartime ministry. He's going to bring in men with private sector experience. There's an interesting quotation in a letter which he writes to the managing director of a major coal mining combine in Wales, asking him, can you have his general manager, a man called Leonard Llewellyn, who performed yeoman service in the war. Lloyd George says to this man, a man called David Alfred Thomas, I'm very anxious not to have my plans strangled by officialdom. For that purpose, I'm trying to gather round me a staff of good businessmen who will sit here in the office and undertake the direction of some of the work. At the same time, he sets up an advisory council of businessmen. He sends off D.A. Thomas, this Welsh coal magnate, to America to look into the British supply chain there. Are they getting value for money? Are there other people who could do the work? It was quite obvious that the government was prepared to throw money at the problem. In the words of Christopher Addison, who was parliamentary secretary at this time, later Minister of Munitions, There were a great many sharks and adventurers who were very anxious to sell the government new processes. The United States shell reserves, they were offered for sale by confidential agents no fewer than, I think, four times. Thankfully, soundings were made with the US government each time, who said, we have never heard of these people. You also then have local efforts. A group of Leicester businessmen set up their own little committee to try and organise small firms in Leicester to build shells which they couldn't do alone. Lloyd George then gets Sir James Stevenson, who is chairman of Johnny Walker Whiskey, put in charge of munitions organisation. Stevenson divides Britain into ten areas. Each of these areas will then be given a quota. At the same time, there is a decision to set up national factories. They start to come online from late 1915 onwards making, for example, shells, shell fillings for the war effort. You've got Clyde Side, the massive factory for explosives at Gretna Green, a model factory. They get Pearsons, the contractors, to erect this huge establishment with a town attached. The town is modern, almost garden city, the ideal for the proposed homes fit for heroes. Interestingly, they miss off in the initial organisation plan, Herefordshire. Stevenson said, Herefordshire, just leave that to the Board of Agriculture, that's what it'll do. But they end up building one of the biggest shell-filling factories at Rotherwas. They're built in remote areas. There is a good reason not to have these in built-up areas. They find that out the hard way at Silvertown in 1917. This is just over the water from the Woolwich Arsenal. Something goes wrong, 60-odd people are killed, and the explosion is so severe that a tongue of fire shoots across the Thames and almost gets the Woolwich Arsenal. This is a government department that begins to organise industry around defined goals to get things done. There were a couple of cases where Britain did not have native industries, so optical glass needed for gun sites and binoculars. We bought it all from Germany. Magnetos for engines. Again, we bought them from Germany. There was a firm in the West Midlands producing a few magnetos for private industry, mostly of the automobile industry. That has got then to be built into something huge. Lloyd George and others come up with the idea of getting Hatton Garden jewellers to do the optical glass. 
you end up with two industries almost created by the Ministry of Munitions and certainly sustained by that, which does lead after the war to an initial thought that maybe the Ministry of Munitions can be continued as an industrial department, not dissimilar to what Japan had after the Second World War with the Ministry of Technology and Investment. Actually, in the post-war climate, this does not work, and it's very quickly disbanded. Lloyd George serves at the Ministry of Munitions until 1916, when Kitchener is killed when HMS Hampshire sinks with him on board on his way to Russia. Lloyd George was supposed to be on the mission, but because of the Easter Rising, he is then retained to pop over to Ireland and try and work his Celtic magic there. The result is that he's moved over to war. You then have the fall of Asquith, Lloyd George and Bonalore ganging up on Asquith saying, we need a war cabinet, we need greater and greater efficiency. This is all part of Lloyd George's emergence as the man of national efficiency, the man of push and go, as people say, quoting one of Lloyd George's own speeches about somebody else. So Lloyd George, December 16, ascends to the premiership. Christopher Addison, his former secretary, becomes Minister of Munitions, tasked with doing more or less what Lloyd George had been doing. You'd get one more change in early 1917. Winston Churchill takes over, the last wartime Minister of Munitions. One of the other roles of munitions is they will shepherd through new technologies. So you have, under Ernest Moir, the Inventions Department. Most of the inventions that they get ideas for are completely useless. But you do get two interesting cases. You have the Stokes trench mortar by Mr Stokes, who was an agricultural engineer. By trench mortar, I mean a gun that sits in a trench which has heavier load shells. The Stokes mortar was a length of piping with the shell shot out the top. No rifling, point that way, drop the shell in and the shell flies off which was far easier than the ones the war office had come up with. Now, the war office had shot it down because there was something wrong with the fuse. Lloyd George got various people to look at it, solve the fuse problem. War office still not interested, but Lloyd George gets private capital from an Indian Maharaja. He orders a 1,000 of these mortars and 100,000 bombs for the mortars, sends them off to the Western Front. They are popular because they are a lot less fiddly than the war office design, they go into mass production. Now, the big innovation is the tank. This is initially come up with not by the Ministry of Munitions. It is the Admiralty. Winston Churchill writes to the Admiralty, I've got a wonderful idea. Let's build a land battleship. It's this big thing on these massive wheels that will trundle over everything, carrying 100 men and goodness knows how many guns. He gives this to Tennyson Dine Court, the Chief of Naval Construction, saying, get me a land battleship. These men have now got the tremendously difficult task of turning this science fiction idea into reality. At the same time, there are experiments being made by a Mr Tritton in Lincoln with caterpillar tractors, he's a tractor maker. And these two ideas slowly coalesce. When Churchill has to go in May 1915, after the Dardanelles disaster. Balfour, who comes in after, want nothing to do with it. Thankfully, Churchill has passed on his file to Lloyd George. Churchill and Lloyd George both have one thing in common. They think big. The result is that by late 1915, they have got a prototype land battleship, the mother tank, and it is shown off in Hatfield Park. Kitchener is there. He appears to be not very interested, but it transpires afterwards, actually he did rather like the tank, but he didn't want anyone to see how excited he was. A.J. Bell, for having poured cold water on the idea for a long time, when he actually sees the thing in action, he thinks it's great. He rides it round Hatfield Park. Kitchener's aide, apparently, was really disappointed when Kitchener said, we've got to go now, because he wanted a ride in this thing. The net result is that Balfour is sold on it, and you then get this slow development of the tank. It does not help that with the shipping crisis, there is a fight over resources. The 
Ministry of Shipping wants all the steel, tanks want a bit of the steel, and then you come into the problem of labour. Kitchener is not wholly wrong, where he says the problem is we don't have the skilled men, the factories do not have the people that they need. Indeed, in some sectors, 25% of the workforce has joined up. So the question then is, what do you do about this? Lloyd George initially says you get unskilled men in, you get women in. The trade unions, particularly the Amalgamated Society of Engineers, a militant trade union that covers this area turns around and it says, we don't like this. This is setting a precedent. This means after the war, the bosses will be able to say this work does not need to be made by skilled men. We have spent years building up our status. Net result, can they import engineers from Canada? Can they get people who joined up back in? It's not enough. You have threats of strikes. The first at Vickers works in Crayford in Kent, later on Clyde's side. It is mostly to do with getting unskilled workers to do work which was marked skilled. So you have an agreement which says that unskilled labour can only do its job if the work is idiot-proof. A skilled man, he'll set up the machine and, and then you'll have someone else who presses the button, pulls the lever. But if there's any adjustment made, that can't be done by a woman, it can't be done by an unskilled labourer. That pretty much remains the case until you start getting a ramping up of the numbers needed at the front, because suddenly you're needing a lot more stuff and there are fewer people to do it. This is where you get more and more women being brought in. This is the great change that people see, is the munitionettes. By the end of the war, you're talking about people saying that perhaps 80% of the work should be being done by women. To conclude, the munitions industry at the beginning of the war and that which we find at the end are almost completely different beasts. They are making different things in different ways. It is more innovative. You still have the government factories as the bedrock, but there's a much bigger superstructure. And the workforce is very, very different. Does this lead to long-term change? Well, for women, the answer is in the short term, no. They are taken on explicitly for war service only, and most of them leave. Do you see lessons learned? Absolutely. There is no need for the equivalent to happen when war breaks out in 1939. They knew what to do, and they moved very quickly to implement exactly what the Ministry of Munitions had done. Innovation, state direction of industry, all these things, they've gone back on. But the fact it had been done, if you're the Labour Party, if you're a socialist of any description, or even a liberal corporatist, you've got this idea that the government can intervene. We organised in war, can we not organise in peace? So there is a legacy, however muted it is by the rush to return to normality. That was Dr Gerard Charmley on the munitions industry. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorn and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Dr Christina Robert about the production of clothing, uniforms and boots.